Thank you so much. Thank you for staying. I won't keep you long. Uh, I'm going to start with a question, though. How many of you have ever found yourselves at any moment reading the dictionary? <laughs> of course you have. This is the biggest group of word nerds in the world. Um, and I ask you that question because not every person is a word nerd. I think we all know that we're special here. Uh, and yet, people come up to me and they'll say things to me. They'll say, my whole family thinks I'm crazy because I read the dictionary. Or they'll be loud and proud and they'll say, uh, in, in, in my family, uh, my parents always tell me, look it up. How many people are from households like that? And it sounds familiar. But either way, uh, whenever I have that kind of conversation, the person who's talking to me is always convinced that they're the first person who's ever told me that they read the dictionary, that they love looking words up in the dictionary. And it occurs to me, this, this lesson is that looking up a word in the dictionary is an intimate act. Nobody sees us do it, nobody knows why, and nobody knows when. Uh, and the fact is, it's not like being a fan of the Boston Red Sox and wearing a hat, or it's not like being uh, an alum of Stanford and wearing a sweatshirt. Nobody knows that you're the kind of person who looks up words in the dictionary, who, who, who hangs out at merriamwebster.com. Um, there are two kinds of people in the world, people who read the dictionary and people who don't. Um, and this idea of knowing which words are being looked up at what time is something that is a very recent phenomenon. Recent because the dictionary is now online. And if we go back in time, we can see uh, the first modern dictionary of English, Samuel Johnson's dictionary, 1755. Uh, he wrote that dictionary during the Enlightenment, when knowledge was first becoming categorized. It was the era of the Encyclopedia Britannica, of the great encyclopedia from France. Um, and Johnson's dictionary was special. It was the first dictionary that had uh, all of the words defined. Before his time, dictionaries only had the hard words. And with Johnson, he defined words like dog and cat and door, which was innovative. He also defined words with multiple senses. And you all know that words are polysemous, right? That they have multiple meanings. Think of the long entries in Webster's Third. I think the longest is take. But set, or get, or run, these are, these are entries that go on for columns in the dictionary. The other thing that Johnson did is he added example sentences from literature, Milton, Spencer, and especially Shakespeare. But when he finished his dictionary, uh, he was congratulated by a matron in London, and she said, I am so pleased that you have omitted the naughty words. To which Dr. Johnson is supposed to have replied, Madam, I find that you have been looking them up. And of course, she had to be looking up the words because how else would she know that they weren't there? So this is an example of what I call negative evidence of a lookup. A lookup is an instance of a person looking up a word. There's another similar story about uh, 150 years later during the Oxford English Dictionary product, uh, Project, the beginnings of the OED, as we call it, the Oxford English Dictionary, the great historical dictionary of the English language. Around 1900, the editor, James Murray, Dr. James Murray, um, who's there in his scriptorium with all the little slips of paper that make the, uh, that make the uh, quotations, that, that, that have the quotations for the dictionary, uh, he got a new word, and it was a medical word. And he wrote to the Oxford Medical College, and he said, should we add this to the new English dictionary? And the answer came back from the Oxford Medical fac Faculty, absolutely not. This word is too abstruse, it's too specialized, only surgeons and doctors would know this word. And then the most important story of the whole 20th century took place. This was in January of 1901. The queen died, Queen Victoria died, which meant that her son would become the next king and the coronation was scheduled, but the coronation was delayed because the new king was sick. In fact, he was very sick. In fact, he was mortally sick. He was so sick that it was feared that he would die before ever becoming coronated king. And the whole nation was curious about the word that was dropped by the editor for the dictionary because it was the word of his condition. 
and the word was appendicitis. So we had another example of the whole country looking for a word that they couldn't find. When we put our dictionary online, Merriam-Webster put the dictionary online in July of 1996. We're coming up on our 20th anniversary. That's a long time to be an online dictionary that's older than Google and Amazon and eBay. We were into trending before trending trended. Uh, but this meant that we could see not only the numbers, how many people clicked, but we could also see the words. And that's what's more interesting to us, is the words. And we'll give you just a little bit of a background about how uh, the Merriam-Webster Dictionary came to be online. You all know this fellow. His, uh, he looks like money. Um, Noah Webster, he wrote the Great American Dictionary in 1828, and he really believed, he was a patriot, he really believed in American English, an American language. That's why he's responsible for the changes in spelling that you all know better than anyone living. Um, the U in color and honor uh, that was dropped, the RE for ER, ER for RE in center in theater, the Z in civilization instead of S, and words like plow, P-L-O-W, that were changed from P-L-O-U-G-H. All of those changes that we today acknowledge as American English, they were, they were instituted by Noah Webster. He also had other ideas of simplifying the language. He wanted the word island to have no S. And he wanted the word tongue to be spelled T-U-N-G. Um, so he didn't succeed with all of his innovations. Uh, but he did succeed in making an American a variety of English, but he was not a good businessman. His dictionary cost $20 in 1828. $20 in 1828 could buy a grandfather clock. It was a luxury item. Uh, and it wasn't until after Webster died that the Merriams, who were the printers, took over the publication of the dictionary, and in 1847, this is the ad, the, uh, the uh, ad for the first edition printed by the Merriams, 1847 for $6. You can see the $6 at the top. And they were good businessmen because they turned the dictionary into an affordable item, more of a household item. After $6, they invented the collegiate dictionary, the abridgment. How many of you know the collegiate dictionary? And most of you, do you have, did you get one for uh, high school graduation, the adults here? Yes. And some of you still have your collegiate dictionary, do you? Um, and it, was it red? Red cover? Uh, that's the familiar dictionary. You know, it was the best-selling hardcover book in American history after the Bible. So it was a very famous product and part of American culture. The collegiate was invented in 1898. It's the abridgment for $3. And then we also innovated with the paperback, the little paperback dictionary, 1947, for 35 cents. And in fact, on sale, it was 25 cents. So you can see a pattern here from $20 to $6 to $3 to 25 cents to free, which is to say when we put the, web, uh, the, the dictionary online, you can see copyright 1996 at the bottom. It was online for free, and the whole idea was distribution, to have the dictionary used by as many people as possible. So the Merriams, as printers and publishers, their mission was to spread the dictionary around as, as much as they could. Um, there was an idea that W.W. Webster might catch on, as you see there. It, that didn't catch on. Um, and this is, what, this is what the old website looked like. Then uh, when we put the dictionary online, we saw which words were being looked up. And there was kind of a static list. And we just sort of said, huh, that's interesting. But then something happened to change that list. The first news event that was shared more widely online than through normal media was the death of Princess Diana in 1997. This is Kensington Palace, where people left flowers for, for Princess Diana. And we immediately saw that the words people looked up changed. They changed immediately. We saw the word paparazzi, which was uh, given as the, one of the causes of her death, paparazzi who were chasing her. Cortege was looked up during her funeral. And interestingly, the word princess was looked up, even though you'd think that most people would know what princess means or even how to spell it. And this gives us a clue about how adults use dictionaries, something that we're, we're going to learn tonight. Um, after uh, 1997, the next really, truly great world global uh, news event was 9-11. And after 9-11, we saw a list of words, a group of words that told a story all by themselves. The first two words 
were concrete words of destruction, rubble and triage. And then we had in day three and day four, uh, words about politics, jingoism and terrorism. And then finally, by the end of that week, we saw words looked up in huge numbers, words that stayed in the top 10 and top 20 for weeks, surreal and succumb, surreal and succumb. And we found that this word surreal, it's the word that people look up during tragedies, after the Newtown massacre, after Robin Williams' suicide, after the Boston Marathon bombing. The word surreal is the word that people look up. And that's at a point when, as a dictionary editor, I say, to myself, I hope the definition of surreal is a good one. I hope it doesn't say of or relating to surrealism. <laughs> but it is a good one, marked by the intense irrational reality of a dream. Marked by the intense irrational reality of a dream. Every word counts in these definitions. And you can see that people were turning to the dictionary for something more than spelling, something more than meaning, but something more like philosophy. They were thinking about the event, trying to process. When Michael Jackson died, the words that were looked up after his death are to this day the, the most intense traffic we've ever seen uh, following a single news event. The words were in the morning of Saturday when the news broke, stricken, and then resuscitate, in the afternoon. On Sunday, the word was R.I.P., rest in peace, requiescat in pace, if you know Latin, and condolences. On Monday, the, the obituaries were published, and in the obituaries, the word icon was used. And then finally, later that week, the word emaciated. And now, this was from the coroner's report of the condition of his body. This became the most looked up word of that week of July of 2009, the most looked up word of the month, the most looked up word of the summer, and the second most looked up word of the entire year of 2009. The curiosity about this word, and it shows some of the qualities that we see uh, with words that are looked up frequently. It has classical roots, and it has a technical meaning, in this case, a medical meaning. It may be a word that you're familiar with in terms of news about, for example, unfortunate people and starvation in other, other places, but not with regard to the most famous pop star in the world. Um, so people look the word up. Now, you can't read these, uh, these graphs perfectly, but I'm just going to show you really quickly. This is how I look at the data on these little graphs. This is the word malarkey, uh, which spiked a couple years ago when there was a vice presidential debate, and Vice President Joe Bar Biden used this word in a debate, and you can see the interest was intense. And I believe this shows one of the strongest motivations that anybody has uh, to look up a word in the dictionary, and that is the simple question, is that word in the dictionary? And the answer in this case was yes. Um, here we have the word marriage, and this is an interesting case. This is 2013, the Supreme Court ruled on Proposition 8 in California, um, legalizing gay marriage, and you see that this word was the most looked up word, but notice there's an echo, there's a second word, the yellow line is the word bigot, and that we see that whenever the word marriage is high, the word bigot is also high. There are many words that, that spike in parallel like that. For example, tornado and hurricane go up together. Um, tsunami and tidal wave go up together. Um, we're gonna see others that are pairs like this, uh, of words that are connected in the news, connected in your mind, um, connected in politics in some way. The thing about marriage in, in, in this case is that the, uh, the, the legal question uh, about marriage is the definition, isn't it? And so people turn to the dictionary. Here's the word apartheid. This is the day that uh, Nelson Mandela died. And so again, you can see what triggers uh, curiosity is when a word is in the news. This is just from a couple months ago, litmus test. And this has to do with the, ch the, the uh, choice of a new Supreme Court uh, justice. Uh, this was right after the death of Antonin Scalia when people were talking about um, nominating a new Supreme Court justice. And litmus test is the term that's often used in politics. But forget all that. The most looked up words in the English language are affect and effect. English is a hard language, and especially for a non-native speaker, using these words is very tricky. Uh, and of the fact is many people fall into this trap. There are so many words that are mistaken for each other, or confusables as we call them, like principle and capital uh, and discrete. All these words that have common spellings, but they are separate spellings for different meanings. The most looked up words in the dictionary 
day in and day out that aren't connected to the news tend to be words like this, pragmatic and ubiquitous and conundrum and paradigm and integrity and insidious. You see, they all have classical roots, right? They all have Greek and Latin roots. They're all a little bit abstract. And my reading on this is that uh, these are the kinds of words that adults feel responsible for. That if an adult encounters the word ubiquitous, they say, I sort of know what that means. But the dictionary brings you up to speed. Sometimes we have words that are looked up in cycles, that are looked up on a regular basis, um, that are looked up in predictable ways. Uh, for example, the word cornucopia is always looked up during the week of Thanksgiving. Um, during the week of Valentine's Day, the most looked up word is love, L-O-V-E. Now, they're not looking it up for spelling, and they're not looking it up for pronunciation. Uh, and the, the definition of love is kind of boring. So I'm not sure I know exactly why people look this word up. And I always say we're good at reading data. We're not good at reading minds. And so we do have some evidence in this case for this word because we get many letters and uh, now emails at the dictionary and we answer them all. Here's a letter from 1994. Uh, it's in response to someone who wrote to Merriam-Webster. We thank you for your letter, but your question about how long love lasts is not something we can answer. We lexicographers are good at defining words. Questions about the nature and permanence of deeply felt human emotions, though, are a little outside our field. We're sorry not to be more helpful. And the fact is, uh, this is signed by Steve Peralt. He's now our director of defining, our chief editor. Um, he's not trying to be funny. It is funny. But uh, he, this is an honest answer. Um, but we get some sense that this person was looking up the word for reasons that go beyond the lexical. Not the spelling, not the pronunciation, but something philosophical. And it tells me that people turn to the dictionary for, for different reasons. Right now, we're seeing an interesting thing. For the first time since the 18th century, we're seeing competition for spelling. Um, camaraderie is the way we normally say this word, camaraderie. But as you know, the preferred spelling is the French spelling, right? The second spelling on, the, on our slide. Um, and yet, the alternative spelling that we give in the dictionary, the more phonetic looking one, the first one, is one that is constantly in our top lookups. And people are looking these two words up constantly, and they show that this word today, in 2016, is fighting a battle with itself. Um, now, you, you realize that Shakespeare wrote his plays without a dictionary. There was no monolingual dictionary of English at that time, which is why his spelling is variable. Sometimes he will spell the same word in different ways. Some of you might know that he spelled his own name in different ways in the old days. And so we can ask ourselves, what came first, the spelling bee or the dictionary? Um, because we don't really know. But until dictionaries existed, spelling was fluid. Spelling was changeable. And it's interesting to me that even today, we have words that are fighting with themselves, that are in competition for the correct form. Two words that are looked up uh, in parallel, as we saw before, are socialism and capitalism, especially this year, election years. We see these words, these political words looked up. This past year, we saw these two words that end in ism combined with communism, racism, uh, and feminism as among the top looked, uh, the most looked up words of 2015, of the entire year. And again, it gives you some notion of what people are thinking about in a political year. Um, now, I didn't put numbers on this, but this is the rough proportion of how many times each of these words is looked up. In other words, there with the EI is the most looked up ver uh, version of this homophone, this word that sounds like it's, uh, like it's neighbors. And it's because of the EI thing, right? I before E or E before I or whatever. That's such a problem in English. Sometimes we see spikes for words and we have no idea why they're looked up. Uh, this happened to me on a Sunday night and I saw the word huskow being looked up. Huskow, it's the, it's the blue line there. Huskow is a, is a sort of Western American word from Mexican Spanish that means jail. And I, I went on Twitter and I said, did someone just say huskow on TV? It was 9 p.m., you can see the time there. And somebody said, yes, it was Al Michaels on football, Sunday Night Football. Um, someone had been streaking across the field and stopped the game. And of course, the police had to come with a blanket and catch the guy and bring him off the field. And 
as a broadcaster, Al Michaels, the, the, the announcer, he had to fill time, right? He had to say words. And what he said was, they're going to take that guy off to the Huskow. They're going to bring him to jail. So you can see that something as, as minor and as insignificant as that can move the needle when it's Sunday night, when no one else is really using the dictionary. Bill O'Reilly has uh, a, a page on his website of words that uh, he uses, and he doesn't define them when he uses them. Uh, one of his favorite words is, um, uh, let's see, I keep forgetting. They're, so, they're such oddball words. Um, snollygoster. Snollygoster is a word that we dropped from the Collegiate Dictionary about 12 years ago, and we might have to put it back in because so many people are looking this word up because he uses it on TV. And it shows you the power of media um, to send people to the dictionary. Snollygoster means an untrustworthy person. Um, this is a hard chart to read, but the little dips are the weekends, and what you see is this is the word culture uh, between the months of August and September. And you see September, uh, the word spikes, and the word the words culture and science uh, spike every fall at back to school time. The other words that spike at that time are plagiarism and diversity. Now, sometimes if you watch these, these, these word spikes often enough, you see things like this rare etymological, meteorological, political coincidence. Lookups in the word clemency were spiking from Elmer Snowden. And lookups for the word inclement were spiking from snow. So these are words that, and news stories that had nothing at all to do with each other, but they were all happening at the same time. And that's what happens when you look at um, the dictionary this way, from the inside, from the data side. And on Twitter, which is Twitter is about the moment, right? It's about the real time mo movement of, uh, of news and information. That's the perfect place to put this kind of thing. Now, this year, I had to put a cat, right? This year is an election year, and there are lots of words that are connected to the election. Not surprising. Socialism may be the top word that's being looked up this year. Demagogue we've seen uh, looked up, uh, especially in the, early, in the, uh, in the uh, late fall. Caucus is a funny word and a funny way to, uh, to, uh, to vote. Presumptive, which is uh, something that just spiked recently. Fascism, again, another of the isms that we've been seeing spiking this year. Xenophobia from the news. Uh, and democracy itself, which should give us all hope that people are looking up the word democracy. Now, here's some of the words that were trending in the last couple of weeks. Transgender, obviously, because of the, the White House ruling, the White House uh, uh, memo that went out last week. Triskaidekaphobia, how many people know what that means? Of course. That's because last, last month we had Friday the 13th, right? Every year, every month that there's a Friday the 13th, triskaidekaphobia is the top looked up word in the dictionary. Unanimous, that was from uh, the basketball uh, choice, uh, the, the, uh, the, the prize, I forget the prize, you're gonna have to help me with this. It was the yeah, MVP award, thank you. Presumptive, there's the word presumptive when uh, Donald Trump uh, is, uh, apparently uh, got, the, got the nomination locked up. Lucifer was looked up uh, the previous week. It was also used in the campaign. Here's an interesting thing. When Prince died, we saw the word icon, but we also saw the word iconoclastic. And that's interesting etymologically because icon is a symbol and iconoclast is that which destroys the symbol. And so people were referring to him as an icon of pop music, but also as an iconoclast, which is kind of rare and unique and an interesting tribute to him and the way that he uh, affected people. Tome before that, and that was from the release of the uh, book for Hamilton, the musical in New York City on Broadway. And there's a big book that was called the Hamil Tome. And Tome, of course, means a big book like that one on the, on the, on the stand there. And finally, Gullible uh, was looked up on April 1st. Uh, and that's, of course, from the great old traditional joke uh, that gullible isn't in the dictionary. Uh, we're on, uh, we're on uh, mobile devices. There's an app for that. Um, and mobile devices uh, show a different pattern, a different way of using the dictionary. Most of us now carry a dictionary in our pockets. And in fact, as of last year, more people look up words in the dictionary on a small screen than on a, uh, than on a desktop computer. That was also true for Google's data last year, too. They, they switched more lookups from uh, mobile, de mobile phones than from desktop devices. And what we found with uh, the behavior of, of mobile uh, lookups 
uh, are interesting patterns. We see, for example, that late at night, two-letter words are looked up. Words like chi and za, Z-A, which means pizza, right? And so that we know that around 11 o'clock Eastern, we can see that in bar rooms and in bedrooms all over America, people are playing Scrabble. Now, we also see that on Thanksgiving afternoon and on Christmas afternoon, these are the same words that are looked up uh, because there's no business traffic, there's no academic traffic, and so the people who are playing Scrabble at home on the holidays uh, are the ones who are generating our, our lookup data. And so we, see, we know when people are playing Scrabble. Now, the, uh, I love this picture, isn't this great? <laughs> How many of you have your own Webster's Third? Can you, can you carry it? Uh, to, uh, to bring this story full circle, we mentioned that the Collegiate Dictionary was the best-selling hardcover book in American history after the Bible. And when I'm talking about data, we're talking about a lot of words. We're talking about 100 million words looked up every month. And so this was a big gamble because we put the dictionary online for free in 1996. And as you know, the business has changed. Everything has changed with the internet. And so our business is no longer principally the book. It, our, our business is, is principally the web and mobile versions of the dictionary. Here, was, here is the gamble. The gamble was if you got this dictionary as a gift at graduation and you put it on your shelf, then we would be out of business. Then we, that would mean we sold books, but they were gifts, they weren't used. But if you took the dictionary off the shelf, if you opened your dictionary, if you read your dictionary, not only do we have a new business model, because we sell dictionaries as well as write them, but we also have a subtle and nuanced and fascinating look at the reasons that you look up words. Thank you very much.